Well, 60 years ago this summer, the ground shook and the sky was ablaze here in southern Nevada. One after another, powerful atomic explosions rattled the Nevada test site just north of Las Vegas. In fact, it was the most intense series of nuclear tests in American history. And among the artifacts that survived intact is a piece of World War II naval history that seems fairly out of place in the desert. The I-team was allowed into the facility, and George Knapp is here with this exclusive story. George? Now, this was a grim, intense era. The summer of 1957 saw one mushroom cloud after another billowing high into the sky. Between late May and early October, 29 atomic fireballs pierced the atmosphere of the Nevada test site. Staying ahead of the Russians was the primary objective, not historical preservation. But now, decades later, one historical mystery has been resolved by a physicist term gumshoe. The code name was Operation Plum Bob. Atomic fireballs shredded the sky almost weekly. The security of the planet hung in the balance. These explosions obliterated pretty much anything within range, almost. I think that's the right one. I think one. it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it is. In the vastness of the still classified test facility, finding anything is a challenge. Yeah. That's it over there? Yeah. Livermore so Lab physicist right Rob Hoffman first there. saw the odd relic two years ago during a tour of the Nevada National Security Site. Well, I thought it was a pretty funny looking trailer, as a matter of fact. But the closer I got to it, the more I decided, geez, that looks like something that might have belonged aboard a ship sometime. Hoffman, who's from a Navy family, was right. It's a gun turret from a heavy cruiser. During World War II, heavy cruisers were often in the thick of the deadliest sea battles. So what's it doing in the desert of Area 2, in a spot that 60 years ago would have been battered by multiple atomic blasts? The barrel isn't a gun, it's a detection device designed to collect and analyze light. The idea behind it was to try and figure out how well a nuclear weapon design actually functioned. The turret was the answer to an engineering challenge. During Plum Bob's frequent tests, test site workers had to build detection bunkers filled with equipment for each blast. They dug trenches, some 20 feet wide, 20 feet deep, and up to a mile long for coax cable that connected to the detection gear. The trenches were then refilled to protect the cable from being vaporized. A contractor named Irv Woodward had the bright idea that if he could make a reusable line of sight with something that could protect the detectors and yet be able to point at each of the devices as they were around, scattered around the site here, then they wouldn't have to lay so much cable, they wouldn't have to make so many special purpose bunkers, they wouldn't have to deploy as many instruments, and they might even <laughs> save some money. <laughs> yeah, you do, yeah, that is funny. And they laughed about it at the time, too. Yes, they did. Woodward and colleagues went to the Mayor Island shipyard in San Francisco, found a couple of turrets sitting on a dock, and chose this one. It was transported south by ship, then was loaded onto trucks, and likely generated plenty of stairs as it traveled the new Interstate Highway 15 to the Nevada test site. It had to be modified considerably. The eight-inch gun barrels were removed, and the assembly was mounted on a foundation that allowed it to rotate 360 degrees. This would be pointed at a device sitting on top of a tower, and then light would shine straight down through this tube all the way into the detectors, which would be housed inside the turret safely from the blast wave that was eventually going to get here from less than a mile away. Diablo was the first, an atomic device detonated from a tower north of the turret, followed by Shasta to the south and Whitney to the west. In between, the turret collected data from the Smoky test, uncorked in Area 9, miles further away. Worked like a charm. It was fantastic. Um, got great data out of it. The turret survived the tests and the elements. Today, it sits in obscurity, home to ferocious test site termites and other curious critters. In the 90s, test site archaeologists collected information about the turret, but there was one big question that remained unanswered but they couldn't tell me what ship it came off of. And being a bit of a Navy history buff and from a Navy family, it just kind of caught my imagination. In 1957, the supply of coaxial cable was very tight, mostly because of a blossoming industry at the time, a little business called television. So using a lot less of it made more sense. It took Rob Hoffman almost two years to figure out the name of the warship that was once the home to the test site turret, but he nailed it. And wait till you hear the, uh, what this ship did in World War II. It's an amazing story that we will unveil tonight at 11.
If you look really closely at it, you'll notice that it's received some rough treatment. Physicist Rob Hoffman say, has well, returned for another look at the turret that first grabbed him more than two years ago. The sprawling test site is littered with remnants of seemingly odd objects once used in atomic tests. Department store mannequins, the stubble of the atomic forest, the rubble of obliterated buildings. But this gun turret got Hoffman's full attention because no one could answer a key question but they couldn't tell me what ship it came off of. A revolving eight-inch naval gun mount. The turret was used as a movable sensor station during four atomic tests in 1957. Three of the devices were detonated within a mile of the thick metal structure. Those explosions, plus six decades of baking in the blistering hot desert, have worn it down a bit. But Hoffman noticed evidence of another kind of trauma, indications that the turret had been in combat. This piece right here, this green piece that looks fairly new, had to have been replaced because that entire piece was blown into the turret when the bomb and the kamikaze actually landed on top of it. Test site officials have long known the turret was obtained from a naval shipyard in San Francisco, that it most likely had been made for a cruiser. Ten heavy cruisers saw action during World War II, but until Hoffman applied his detective skills and dug into various historical archives, no one could say for sure the name of the ship. He studied the telltale scars on the turret, then compared them to combat records from the wartime cruisers. One by one, he eliminated names. Every one of those ships served in World War II with great distinction. Um, some of them didn't last very long. Uh, four of them were lost to enemy action. Two of them were actually expended due to friendly fire in Operation Crossroads, which was the first atomic weapons test to occur after World War II. A faded inscription on a hatch door suggested the turret was from the USS Pensacola, but Hoffman determined the door was itself a repair, added later. The clincher for Hoffman was a chiseled inscription he found on the side of the turret. It matched perfectly shipyard records he'd found. The ship it came off of was the USS Louisville, just like the Louisville Slugger. A slugger is right. The Louisville engaged in some of the deadliest naval battles of the war. Hoffman tracked down three crew members who confirmed to him how some of the damage was inflicted. The kamikaze airplane actually landed right on top of it, just on the left side here. The bomb, according to the repair yard, went off right above the left gun here as the plane was impacting on the turret. During a battle off the Philippines in January 1945, in a two-day period, the Louisville was hit by desperate kamikazes, twice. The second deadly attack was recorded on film. And this is the original footage. It's been slowed down. The kamikaze slams directly into the top of the turret, setting off a bomb and a fireball. 38 crew members died. More than 100 suffered burns, including the ship's captain. The Louisville stayed in the fight for another day before heading for repairs. The sailors were buried at sea. When she came back, they wanted to turn her around fast. They had a spare turret at the yard. They pulled the old one off, put the new one in, and sent her back. And she got hit a third time when she went back to Okinawa with another kamikaze, so three times. The turret that was hit by the kamikaze was repaired, but the war ended before it was needed again. It sat on a dock for 10 years before it was picked for a special job at the Nevada test site. The USS Louisville was mothballed and eventually was sold for scrap, but a piece of it is still around. It's a piece of history that you would drive right by here and never see. <laughs> we almost lost it. George Knapp, 8 News Now. Now, Rob Hoffman is proposing putting a plaque on the turret so that its history would be preserved for the future. And it looks like the NNSA, the agency which oversees the test site, is moving forward with that plan. On our website, we are posting additional information if you'd like to learn more.